installment of Harp Teachers Gathering. We have two really wonderful and amazing harpists with us today. We have Krista Grix, and I took a little bit off of her website, so I will read that for you. Equally adept as both a classical and jazz harpist, she is one of those rare individuals who can make the transition from the jazz rhythm section to the symphonic string section sound effortless. The appeal and respect of her abilities has taken her throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe as an invited soloist and clinician at major harp festivals and conferences. Krista enjoys using the sound of the harp and the sound of her voice to create meaningful, beautiful communication and connection with her audiences. She's got four recordings. She has served as on-air development host for WRCJ-FM in Detroit, where she researches, writes, and produces short educational spots that highlight the numerous connections between classical and jazz music. And also, Krista, I remember a couple of years ago, I read a Facebook post or something from you. It was one of your Saturdays where you had a wedding in the morning, a rehearsal in the afternoon, and a Catholic wedding followed by either a jazz thing or a symphonic thing where you actually said you sang the Ave Maria at the wedding. Oh, yes. And uh, they lived to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> I do some singing, but I would never especially for an elite audience like this I would never <laughs> I would never sing for you <laughs> but sometimes for weddings you know um I like to sing at, actually at the end of the prelude I think it's a nice way to transition to the wedding ceremony and I do uh, I don't have a large repertoire but I do sing a little bit and I do a lot of voiceovers oh great great now we're going to talk about Denise Oh, Denise, is Denise Grupp Verbin or is it Verbon? Verbin is correct. Okay, good, good. I never really knew. Okay, you are an internship manager for the School of Liberal Arts and an adjunct instructor of music at Owen State Community College in Toledo. She is a harpist, teacher, recording artist, and composer. And she's got a lot of theory books out. Her lever drill and pedal drill books are popular additions to any exercise routine. She has been a working harpist for over 35 years, and she co-directs an annual harp festival called the Harp Gathering. Okay, it's very popular. Uh, she has self-released a variety of publications for the harp and three CDs with her acoustic guitarist husband, Michael. Uh, Krista and Denise are both at Denise's home today and um, they both have publications on our website. And please enjoy 15% off their music and Bernard Andre's music. The coupon was in your reminder email, which you received either yesterday afternoon or this morning. And I'm going to put myself on mute and lovely ladies, take it away.
What? <laughs> I love this piece. I love this piece from the minute I set my fingers to it um, many years ago. And uh, thank you for letting me play oh, your beautiful, please. beautiful heart. I love hearing my own heart played by somebody else. And know, I wouldn't so The yeah. sound is gorgeous. I, I, when I first played this piece, I thought, holy cow, what, what? an enormous amount of information and um, material we can unpack in this piece for teaching our students. And so when uh, Denise uh, roped me in or uh, invited me to be here today, um, to uh, it graciously invited me to be a part of this presentation, uh, I suggested that we work on this piece and gratefully it's she agreed, yeah, I'm so piece. happy. So um, I hope you enjoy it too. I think there's a lot of things that we can discuss about this piece, including music history, music theory, musical phrasing, musical technique, um, the study of uh, jazz harmony, as well as classical harmony. And that of course leads to improvisation. So if you have an early intermediate student, I think this is a great piece to really touch on all kinds of things. And I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of music history, and then I'll, I'll go we'll transfer to Denise. But um, first of all, maybe some of you know more than I do about the title. It's the French automat, which means um, automaton in uh, French. And I think you can start with your students with a little discussion about why do you think Mr. Andre um, use that as the title. I have my own theory, which is that I think that this whole suite of music in this book teaches us to have fingers that can do the work. You know, that's a good basic foundation for developing our fingers, almost like a robot. So that's my feeling about why he, uh, he chose Automat as the title. But that's a good opportunity and opening discussion for you and your student. And then I would go on to uh, a, what a pavan is. A pavan is a ceremonial dance that started in the 17th century. So we have many pavans in music history. It is meant to be, a, they thought, um, Music history tells us that it's Italian or Spanish in origin, and that it was a dance of the, well, a procession, a ceremonial procession of the aristocracy, perhaps to show off their uh, attire. So the setting, the metronomic setting on this piece is 63 equals a quarter. My feeling is it should be a stately, processional, so I take it a little bit slower. I would invite your students, if you choose to teach this to them, to do um, some research on French and English dance suites like Bach, and even contemporary dance suites like Salzedo, and so that they have a perspective of what this book offers to them. How many pieces are in this book, Krista? I, can't, I think I 13. It. I do have it with me. Why don't you take over with the fingering and okay, I will we look that up. Talk about how many, because there's a whole, this it's book a is whole, a great book. All kinds of dances, Baroque. Uh, while you are making the switcheroo there, um, there are some people that are saying the sound is going in and out because of that orig original sound for musicians thing. So. I think if you just play little bits at a time, okay. it'll be okay. I think that maybe going through a whole piece is not going to work anymore, but little bits at a time, it will work. Probably at this point, it's about little bits at a time. So I'm sorry we couldn't solve that, but yeah. Um, so, uh, well, Krista looks to see how many are in that book, uh, which is a lot, actually. Isn't this the first one in the book? It's the, the second book? one. It's the second one in the book. So the next thing we thought we would talk about is about fingering and placing. And, you know, Krista was saying a lot of things to unpack in this piece. And uh, here I'm gonna look at a couple of different spots here to talk about. So the, the beginning in the right hand is, is a A minor triad at the top with uh, one, two, and three. And then you drop your four down 
to the to the e below so you're you're kind of you're playing it in in the right hand anyway i'll just talk about right hand in a second inversion with the extra note you know added to it and i think there are certainly a lot of different ways to do fingering i just kind of try to find something that's practical so this first measure with the two pairs of four sixteenths and a quarter i have it set up where you slide your thumb so I, I go four, three, two, and I put my third finger down on that F for the sixth, and I slide my thumb down. And it keeps you connected to the heart. Then you set up the next group, and the same thing. It keeps you connected. Mary's showing it to us. Thank you, Mary. That's so helpful. Thank you. And then connect it. And so you can do a little thumb slide to stay connected. So put your third on. You can either slide or then the next group has too many fingers for harp, right? So we only have four fingers. So what I do with this is I do a crossover. Four, three, two. Then I put one, two, and three on in a row. It's coming down the scale, right? One, two. Then I do a crossover. And I work with students to teach them about how important it is to keep your hand over, open for the crossover. I like to tell them about that because if they cross over like this, their thumb won't make any sound. It doesn't, it, there's no room for it to move. So I, I show them that you cross over and I, I like to pre tell them that pretend like you're in a play and you're pretending you're on the phone and then there's what your hand looks like, you know? So you come over, you cross over. Now this group goes down. You put one, two, three, and four all in a row. And we're going to play the three and the four together for that beat three. And what I do is I skip over to beat four, put my thumb on that A, and then I drop the two in. It's kind of like a, I call it arrow placing because I'm leaving that two until the last moment. Because otherwise, where, where was I? Okay, I got lost for a second. If I try to put my two on there, the chances of it buzzing on that F are very right up there. And so what I do is I wait to put the two on until the last minute. And then there's my sixth. You introduced me to that. This, this is well, this afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah. And it's just such a, a clever uh, uh, concept, technical concept, to just drop your second finger in at the last minute. The last minute. I like that a lot. It avoids it. a lot of buzzes. Well, it, it takes away the buzzes, and it's also more comfortable for your hand. Yes, and you're because anchored. When you start, and you are anchored, you're anchored because we put the thumb over ahead of it. So that happens again in the second line, since Mary's showing us the music, that's so kind of you. In the second line, I do that again. So I have the one, two, three, I move my thumb up to that F again. Then I drop the two in and the six just drops right in. Then it does it again. There's that, I call it arrow placing. And in the music, I draw a little arrow to show that you're placing from those two notes. The next measure, that third, fourth measure of the piece, second measure, second line, same thing. There's another one. And this one, I'm gonna do a slide. And then it's just any way you can stay connected, mm -hmm. you know, and I have some of my students, you know, how our students tend to challenge us. Right. And they say, well, why do I have to do that? I don't want to do that because all they want to do is hear the music. Right. They're like, how do I do I do that? And I say, because it's going to be smoother and you'll get to it faster. Placing is like so important. In fact, Mary, when you asked me to do this, you commented about Eddie Grzynski. And I can tell you my first lesson with Eddie Grzynski, I was 16 years old. And the first thing out of his mouth was about placing. And I know it, it was that jig, uh, that gig or jig in the Lucille Lawrence book. So uh -huh. the player, that was the first piece I ever played for him. And all he, all he, and he didn't really yell, Mr. Grzynski didn't yell, but he felt like, he felt like it because I was 16, you know. And it was all about placing. Harp is all about it's placing. All about placing. And Denise, it makes could you could you tell us a little bit about the legendary Eddie Drzinski for us old people who know of him as a legend? 
So Mr. Draczynski, who's passed away a number of years ago, I was devastated, but um, he played with the Chicago Symphony from, I think, 1957 to 1987. Before he played with Detroit, you knew that, right? Yes, yes, yes. I, mean, yes back, I knew that right before, before that. His, his picture is on the DSO. Is uh, it really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, in you the, have to send me a snapshot yeah. of that. Yeah. I would love to see that. He also uh, played with um, Pittsburgh for a time, mm -hmm. and in fact, was on um, what's the man's name? Uh, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, man. Oh, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. He was on the Mr. Rogers show, and I have seen that video. Oh, no And kidding. he was with his pedal harp and Mr. Rogers, and people gathered around and everything. And Mr. Rogers was asking you questions, and you could tell, and every, I called him Mr. Brzezinski, but people called him Eddie. And you could tell that all Eddie wanted to do was play. Because <laughs> Mr. Rogers started asking questions. Well, let's, I'll just play. He said, you could just tell that's what he wanted to do. Um, Mr. Brzezinski was like E.F. Hutton. He didn't say much, but when he did, thou shalt listen. And he wore Aramis. And if I smell Ar somebody wears Aramis, nobody wears. Uh, have you have you smelled Aramis in years, right? No. But if somebody wears Aramis, I'm at my harp lesson at his house on West Rosalind Place in Chicago. Oh. And when he taught you a lesson, he was even closer than Krista and I are sitting. He almost sat right on top of you when you had a lesson, which was in his dining room. But everything was very, very practical. I discovered a few years after I um, started studying with him that he studied with Salzedo and his techniques were nothing like what you expect Salzedo techniques to be. And I and he studied with him when he was 16 at Curtis. Oh, wow. yeah. And I said to him, you studied with Salzano? I asked him one time. I, I got brave to ask. He said, well, yes, I did, but I didn't believe in a lot of the things that he taught. So there was the, you know, but um, when Mr. Drzezinski speaks, you know, people listen. And it was, it was truly, uh, it was a, truly an amazing privilege to, to have the opportunity to study sure. with him. So thank you for asking. I didn't know you were going to ask me that, but is that kind of what you wanted to know? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, because my, my harp teacher, Jean Henderson, would always talk about him with kind of a glint in her eye. You know, she, yeah. Um, there is a question here. Someone wants to learn more about placement. So how okay. can we learn more about placement, she says. So I, I think that one tip about placing is that, that you also, placing goes with what you're choosing for fingering, right? And so you look at when you're making a plan for fingering, you look at the destination. So if we just take the first four notes of this piece, it's right there, four, three, two, one, you can see where your thumb needs to go. So you look at the, you look at the group, mm -hmm. right? The group of strings and you say, what does this need? Can I reach that? And in this case you can with your four, three, two, one. So you write it up, and you place it. Now, another thing that I teach that I don't hear it from a lot of people is when you're dropping your fingers into those four strings, you don't do it this way. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we call that you, drop chords. Drop chords. Drop I chords. like that. You that's a great dropping on so all notes. I talk about, yes, and that's the ultimate, but not everybody can do that. Right. Start, right. So she's talking about you put all your fingers on at once. That's yes. the ultimate. But as a stair step of mm -hmm. teaching, I tell students, and I'm also, especially as beginners, I'm trying to get them to not play like this because mm -hmm. everybody does it. And it just it just hurts my hand. Just to, I'm like, how can you play like that? It's just it's so uncomfortable. So uh, looking at that same chord, I would tell a student, put your thumb on first, put it on that E, and just let gravity hang out your fingers. Just, just sit there for a second and then drop your fingers in. And there's your hand position. And then what I show them is I say, your hand position is extremely ergonomic. If you just grab, grab your thumb, look, uh, I'm not doing anything. I'm just doing gravity. Look, there's my hand position. I don't have to do anything. It's right there. And so when you talk about placing, you look at the group, you place from the top down. Ultimately, you're going to do all at once, but not everybody mm -hmm. can do that right away, right? You put your thumb on. If you have to, you go one, two, three, four. But you also look at that shape. I know that's a whole nother, a whole nother workshop potentially, yeah. but looking at the shape, remember I said the top of this is in 
A minor triad, which is thirds, A, C, and E. And then the last note that your four plays is the E at the bottom, which is a fourth. So you look at that shape. And so I hope that's a little bit helpful about placing. Part of it's about fingering. Then you look at your destination. Say, well, where do I need to end up? Well, in that particular case of those four notes, you're ending up on that E. So you say, okay, how do I solve that? In the next measure, you have to look at the destination, that measure two, because you're gonna have to cross over because you're gonna run out of fingers. Let's see, I have to do the whole thing because the counting doesn't work. I got my mess up. So there's your four, three, two, one, right? Thank you, Mary. Then I did one, two, and three. Then I crossed over. And you're gonna say, well, why did you choose to cross over after three? And the reason is because I looked at the destination and I knew that I wanted to do those bottom two notes with three and four. And so I backed it up. And I said, what happens? How do I get there? And they're all in a row. <laughs> and then, um, how we, because we can't see the questions. So I'm glad to have you interrupt and ask us. Did that help a little bit when talking about fingering? Oh, it, the ultimate tip is look at the destination. Look at where you're going to end up. Where do you need to end up in the whatever the group of notes is? Is that do you have a thought about that? To add? I, I was going to say something about drop chords. I oh. I know I know that it's hard. That's right. So to get all of them on. But I have a game. I play a game. You want to switch? Which, no, I, oh, I okay. can do it from here. Okay. I play a game. I put the metronome on. Oh no! <laughs> I know, and no one likes that. But I put it on at a slow tempo, and we have to count to floor, four, and. We hold our hand out as far as possible. So like um, one, two, can't move until four. Oh, sorry. One. Wait, wait, wait. What am I doing when I get to four? Oh, what 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 chord do you want to play? Do you want, well, to, you do want that? to do that first one? Okay. Okay. So one, two, three, four, land. Okay. And you have to it's a game. All right. So oh. you're you're what you're doing is you're learning the shape. You're you learning know, the, shape, about the and, shapes, and right? the metronome tells you when you can move. One. And two, on four, I put it on? Uh, at, at, you can't move until four. One. And you land two, on one. Three, four, four one. one. <laughs> uh-huh. You won't you get call, it. What do you call time. it? Did you say? Uh, um, drop, drop course. Drop course. Yeah. And you can't move until after four, but you have to get there by one. And you can set the metronome as fast or as slow. I mean, it's not, it, it's the idea that you're just going to get there in a certain amount of time. And you're teaching your hand what the shape is. Yeah. Whatever a, that a shape matter of might be. Learning. Yeah. Oh my God. It's, and I make it a game with my students. It's fun. It's a game. It's not, you know, anything you have. Well, to going do. with that, you have students who are music reading challenged. Mm -hmm. And so to go with that, uh, one time I had a student who had read music before he came to me. Okay. He was a guitar player. No offense, Michael. Michael's over there. No offense to a guitar player. But for example, we could just use those first four notes to put his fingers on. He would say, he would say, E, A, C, E. I'm like, you don't have to do that. You find where your thumb goes and you learn the shape. Mm -hmm. You don't have to identify those individual notes. I, another, uh, this is another thing that yeah. I do. Aim for two and three in the middle. Well, and that can work as well. Yes, yes absolutely. Then two and three, because, then you're, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because so sometimes that comes out. That. And then the, the last thing, um, and this is going way ahead in the, the, uh, pres the presentation, the outline. But when you think of those first four notes as four notes, E, A, C, E. Yeah. Your brain is, you know, processing four things. If you learn theory, yes. which you and I yes. are theoreticians. We are. <laughs> I love theory. Not yes. everyone does. But, but when you learn theory, it becomes one thing, an A minor chord, right? And that really helps with learning the position of the hand, learning to memorize it, because you're not thinking of four notes, you're thinking of one. Of the chord. And in this chord. case, it's an A minor chord. In second inversion, it's got yeah. the, it's and got it's the just, E on the, the bottom. The brain only has to process one yes. thing instead of four notes, Yes, which is why my my students probably are i'm a metronome and theory teacher and i i'm <laughs> gee I, I don't have a ton of students i wonder why 
<laughs> I always say the Met, we have love hate with the metronome. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, um, yeah, it gives us many, it gives us many gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, any other questions coming in? We, we don't want to talk through people asking us things. We have <laughs> someone who wants to know how long each of you has been playing the harp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, I have a new answer to this. Oh, okay. I have a new answer to this. I had a little old lady come up to me at a gig and ask me that very question. And I said, take the gray hair and subtract 11. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Do you like it? That's a good one. Um, since I was 11. Uh -huh. That's yeah, I'm, That's I'm a 50 answer. year veteran. And, and I should also say, you know, this is really kind of cool too, because you studied with Eddie Duzinski. My teacher was Lucille Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So those are two. She icons. studied with Salzado too, right? Well, she was married to Salzado. Okay. Well, so yeah. She, yeah. Well, and well, was well, his partner, yeah. collaborator on um, his method books. So. And those two people probably knew each other. Yeah. You know, Eddie oh, probably knew Oh, her. yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. What year absolutely. was she born? Um, no. I think. It's either 12 or 17. My okay, other so teacher was, was Velma Froud, and I can't remember which was born in 12 and the, which one was born in 17. But. Okay, so she was older. Eddie was like 1924. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she uh, was yeah. a little older. Yeah, she was yeah. older. But it's just kind of neat to have such I know, venerable it? teachers it's, in um, our background. One of my students, when I started him, uh, made a uh, harp teacher family tree. It was really funny. He had it all written out of his his teacher was this and it went back to this and it was kind of fun. Kind but, of cool. But anyway, um do you well, wanna one more comment here from Charlotte Meisner who says that Suzanne Balderston, now there's another name we could talk about, right? <laughs> Suzanne Balderston taught her to place two and three first in a four note chord. She says place the innards. Place yeah. the innards. Place the innards. That yeah. sometimes helps. Yeah. Do we have, I was going to talk about the harmony of this. Um, you will switch? Uh, maybe we should. Well, it, it, should I go there? First of all, is that, uh, is that what our, our listeners, our members would like yeah, to? Yeah, I mean, that's why I keep asking for questions. Yeah. We want to be able to share. But I, I think there's a lot to unpack with this harmony. So if, if you'd like to talk about that, this is the Pavan in Automat. Um, if you have the music at home. So, okay, we'll switch over. Um, you know why I like this? Mm. Is that uh, it is adaptable for both classical music and jazz. So by the time your students get to this level of playing, I would hope that they know what intervals are. And I, I would expect that most people know intervals that are uh, attending this seminar. Well, intervals are so visual on the harp. Yeah, they are. And, and, and whereas on the piano, you can see the major and minor thirds on the harp, doesn't matter if it's pedal or lever, you, they're just, it's a third. Except it's a that you can't see the- You can't see the accidentals. Right, right? you yeah. can't see the, the kind of interval, the right. kind of third, the kind of seventh. Right. So um, this piece, uh, let me just say, that the bass line outlines is really the roots of the chords. It goes down in fifths at the uh, beginning. So we have A, which is one, to D, which is four, G is seven, to C, which is three, to F, which is six, to, well, sometimes D, sometimes B, it changes, mm -hmm. four, five, and then to one, but also we have- but That was so pretty. That was just that, the base. Yes, you know? yes, and you could really work on a hand uh, separate. And so I would have my students, first of all, understand what the root of each chord is. Know the, the root of the chord, A, D, we have a G. Then we're starting to look at um, thirds, right? And so we have A minor, D minor, G, C, F, D minor, E minor, and A. Then as I'm teaching harmony, we get to sevenths. And um, I just want to say that playing as much as I have in different styles of music, 
often our students are um, intimidated by seven they, they chords. Are. And most of your music is going to either be major sevenths, minor sevenths, or dominant, or dominant sevenths. And, and I think it's easy. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I know some students get intimidated. So the rule of thumb is, if you have a major third and a major seventh, you have a major seventh chord. If you have a minor third and a minor seventh, you have a minor seventh chord. But and people have to know what major and minor sevenths right. are. So yeah. that's so like you another have to step. Teach that. But you're right. right. Once you know major that, major third, you're major seventh, mm -hmm. major seventh chord. Yeah. Minor third, minor seventh, minor seventh chord. And then you have the one in the middle, and that's the dominant seven. And jazz musicians just refer to that as a seventh, you know, G7, D7, E7. And, that's and if you're the, doing a Roman number, you write five, seven. And if you're doing it big in class, the, the big classical way, yeah. big five. Yeah capital five with the seven. So that's that's my rule of thumb. Major third, major seven, major seven chord. Minor third, minor seven, minor seven chord. And then the dominant seven is just referred to as a seven chord. And dominant happens on the fifth degree. On the fifth of, degree of the scale. We'll just say major scale. It's, and this this piece is, is modal. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a mm -hmm. dominant seventh key mm -hmm. chord in this pavon. Right. It's it, Well, the, it, it, you're right. Yes. There's no... Yeah. Right. It's modal. It's yeah. in the natural. In this line. particular case. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there mm -hmm. are a lot of good seventh chords in this piece. It, there is there is the G7, but it doesn't function as a dominant in this piece, you know, right? Yeah. So sure. interesting. But then that's what gives it its beautiful character. So tell us a little bit about how knowing what the chords are, if you were going to analyze it and write the chords, how does that help you with the the thing that you like to do well yeah so like <laughs> last night i don't know see I, I, this is a gorgeous gorgeous harp and the sound is so beautiful and i'm so happy that you let me play no problem but i'm not i i just met i just met this your is, harp this is violet this is violet Viol i just met violet an hour ago so i you know so last night i was like okay so here's a couple things you can do, and then I'm going to show you some ideas. First of all, I would use that um, initial chord. Mary, would you um, put the first line up on the page again, on the screen again, if you could? Yes. So we have this E, uh, this A minor chord. And here's another thing that I do with my students, uh, which is we all know that there are 24 variations of our finger pattern, right? Well, I've never done the math, but <laughs> I'm a little Each frightened about Each finger has like six, <laughs> six things that it can do. So here, if we are starting with uh, our fourth finger, four, three, two, one. We could do four, three, one, two. Oh, I see what you're doing. Okay. We do four, two, one, three, four, three, one, two. As you see, and I have this in the outline, all each finger could start. So one of the things I would challenge your students to do is every time you come to this chord, do it differently, do a different pattern. It's still going to be the same harmony. You right. can still, right. I mean, and yeah. there's two things that that's quick and easy improv. It's quick and easy improv. because people are so scared of improv. Right. They're and like, they run screaming from the room. Right. right. So yeah. if you know what your chords are and First of all, you do have to study the chords. Well, you really have to do that work. Yeah. But then you can adapt with different patterns. And that's an easy way. So I was, um, last night, I don't know if I can play this very well, but you know, the original is. chords and and just changing some of the patterns and this I think is a great way to kind of teach our students how to improvise and not be threatening you could also change the rhythm oh yes within the confines of that 4-4 mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but you could do something yeah. mm -hmm. the second section um Right. 
it's and a, you kind of stayed within the feel of the piece, but just changed what you did. Based mm -hmm. on the chords. Based on the chords. And a lot of what you did, would it be fair to say, is you use the notes on the page. You just changed the way you use them. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. I started out doing this, Denise, because I do you sub for me a couple times. Remember in our, our early, early days, like 40 years ago, <laughs> uh, I had a gig at the Dearborn Inn. Didn't you sub for me a couple times at the Dearborn Inn? Well, I played. Are you, are you played. You had the gig after me. It was a Sunday brunch. I played Sunday brunch yes. at Dearborn Inn for seventeen years. Yes, mm -hmm. and I only had about five, but okay. I did every night Monday through. Oh, you did a night gig. Mine I was, did, a, mine was yeah. a Sunday brunch. Yeah, I okay. had like Monday through Friday. No, Monday that was through before Thursday, I was there. Yeah, six to ten, and uh, night after night oh, after gosh, night. Gosh, that's a long night, time. That that was great for learning how to improvise on the harp because four hours every night you want to change things around or you would go nuts so when you're talking about learning the theory you know everybody a lot of people run screaming from the room you say theory oh no i don't want to know anything about that but when you're working with your students or working with yourself figure it out for something you're doing don't and there's nothing wrong with a workbook but figure out take a few measures of something you're playing and learn how to analyze that chord and figure out what it is and write it down, put the chord symbols oh, in. Oh, sure. Right? Learn how to do the chord symbols and then make it so it's practical to go with the piece that you're learning. Don't just say, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna learn how to do all these five, seven chords, but you don't get to see what's, it's being done, what's being done with it. And here you can say, okay, like that first chord, the right hand is A minor in second inversion, but the, the the left hand has an A on the bottom, so it's really the whole thing is really right. There's right. really root position. So yeah. in the comments, uh, ladies, um, Charlotte said that she teaches those chord inversions and patterns as a BLT sandwich. She says it doesn't matter what order the ingredients are in; it still has the same flavor. So like that BLT. That's, that's a great, great idea. Idea for sure. I like that. She's right. You know, it doesn't you put it in any order you want? Still mm -hmm. the same chord. It's just yeah. I was also going to mention as artists, it's our job to unpack and analyze and understand what the composer is trying to say. And as you get more advanced as a harpist, you want to be teaching your students that that's, that's what they need to do. And one way to unpack and analyze and understand what a composer is trying to say is know what the harmony is. Then you, then you can see the pillars in the piece and where things are going. You, you really do need to understand what's going on. It helps. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think helps. We were talking, it kind of goes with some, something else you and I talked about. Um, and this is totally unrelated to this piece, but it occurs to me that it's useful as a teacher. It's one time I had a student learning. Oh, we talked right, about that? right, right. Yes, she yes, was yes. learning. Um, an arrangement, wonderful arrangement actually by Sylvia Woods of the theme from some the movie somewhere in time, which has no words. It's just, you know, and she's learning this piece and um, her name was Pamela. They said, Pamela, have you seen this movie? And she said, no. And I said, you may not come back to a lesson and play this piece until you've seen the movie. So you need to know, or if you're playing something, a popular thing that does have words, you need to know the words yes. for the interpretation exactly. Of, exactly of what's going on. So, um, so I won't I won't tell what I say to the screen if I watch somewhere in time because I want to ruin it. If there's someone that hasn't seen it, but oh, anyway, it's a great movie. So great Michigan in my movie. great state in your great state of Michigan. <laughs> yes, and that's coming from an Ohio. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Although I'm really Rare close. words indeed. I'm really close to Michigan, so I can almost walk to Michigan from my house. Yeah. Anything else showing up that we should have? that you'd like us to address before we, you know, we're chatting. What do we, so. oh, I, I have so a few 44. things to say, but I want to make sure we're answering questions. I don't want anybody to feel left out. Uh, nothing new, y'all are good. Nothing new. Okay. Um, you want to, you want to talk do you about. Do you want to switch? We'll switch for a minute, anything? just yeah. to talk okay. about the, let's see, how are we doing this? Oh, oh, we had a plan. We just can't seem to remember the plan. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to sh spend a little bit, because you have some more to talk about too, um, to talk about how there's so many different things going on at once. And we talked about calling it soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Mm -hmm. And if we look over here at the 
top of page two, I'll use that spot. So there are four different things going on. I'll do the first two measures at the top of page okay. two. Okay. So starting from the soprano, we'll call it the soprano singers. So that's the sopranos, right? Mm -hmm. The altos are doing this. right hand actually plays both of those lines. So you want to be aware that those are both there. Oops. So there's soprano and alto in the in the uh, treble. Then the left hand, here's the tenors. Basses are always my favorite. They're so yes. cool. The basses are doing that. Yeah. And then the left hand actually plays both of those lines. that there are these different things going on helps you to learn the piece. Let's see if I can play it all together now. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, four different things going on. Uh -oh, let's try one more. Give me another chance. <laughs> Especially this one was a great choice for doing this. Recognizing that there's all these different lines going on and listen for those as you're playing it. You know, sometimes I'll talk about pretend you're the cello player. You know, imagine you're the cello player. What's the cello player doing? In that particular, in those particular two lines, the first note that the right hand plays is the first note of both the soprano line and the alto line. Because it, the soprano goes, and the alto goes, there's that same E. It's just so cool. It's so cool. If you were a piano student, yes. you, you, <laughs> oh, I mean, I piano that. students have Bach. They right? do. They yes. have Bach, and they learn at, at a very young age how to express two different lines. They, they, almost everyone studies those Bach two-part inventions. Mm -hmm. yes. We don't have that. Right. But we do have this piece. It's and very related a, to that, isn't it? It, it yes. is a chance to teach our students what they would learn if they, if we had a repertoire of, you know, Bach. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, we weren't around at Bach's time, you know, so, <laughs> well, we were, but not to, uh, with all the uh, accidentals and so forth. We don't, we just don't have that repertoire. So this piece is really great to learn how to play all those songs. And lines. it's a little bit challenging to do that. Oh, yeah. Yes, the lower fingers have to bring out the melody in that yeah, second and, beat. And that's another example of working out the fingering. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be, you and I are really good sight readers. So we'll put something in front of us and we'll just play it. And I'll do that and I, I'll have some sort of a section that isn't working for me. And I'm like, Denise, get out your pencil and make a plan for the fingering so you're committed to it. Mm -hmm. um, one time uh, I'll have a student who's having trouble with a section and I'll say, well, what finger are you using there? Because you see that they're falling over it and say, well, I have, I don't know. Fingering in place. It's like, all fingering in place. You have to make a plan. Yeah. And then you're committed to the plan because is there more than one way to do what we have here? Of course there is, mm -hmm. but you need to have a plan so that every time you come to it, mm -hmm. otherwise your fingers are just gonna get all 
So Next stay story. right there oh, okay. because um, talking about lines, you're, okay. can you play the first line? The very oh, the first whole piece, line? Both uh, yeah, hands? Just the, both hands. Okay. Um, she, okay, so uh, just play it. Oh, yeah. Back to page one. Well, back to page one. Page Mary. one. Okay. So and what just am I the doing? first two measures. That's all. Just the uh, first both two. Both hands? Both hands. Okay. I want you to play that. All right, now we're going to talk about passing tones. Oh, all right. And these, technically, these aren't passing tones, but <laughs> because they are seventh in the chords. But I want you to play it again, but only play the bottom note and then play it as two A's. So this D, C. Okay. Like and that. All for the left hand, all eighth notes to the left hand? Uh, just... Play the, you're going to play the left hand. And then broken. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right, now to listen to as eighth notes, just on the second beat and the fourth beat. Got it. Is that pretty? You made a, oh my gosh, Krista, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> because Yeah, because I never play anything as written <laughs> ever. But, but here's what she created in the left hand. It's sometimes a uh, okay. That's the C on the second beat of the first measure of yeah. the left hand. It's I think technically would be called an upper appoggiatura, but and it, it um <laughs> I'd have to it go just, look it up. To it's see just it's a nice line, and you can do that all the way through there. I, I guess I want to stress to our members that are watching our participants that it is your job as a performer to make music. Yes. And I always think of what's on the page. That's why I start off and I figure out what is the composer trying to say? What do they want to say? I find the analysis and then I make it my own. I express. Let's play those. Let me play those two measures as written, yeah. followed immediately by okay. your simple idea that you gave. So we can hear them. Yeah. Compared. And if you want, you can even continue it to four measures. Here's the as written. I'll do two more. Okay, now play the same two with your just changing that one idea you had. kind of did was composed a new tenor line. Yeah. Because you went I mean the tenors and the basses could do the same thing I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. What a cool idea. And yeah, you didn't oh, change much. No. Mm -mm, it's just being free. Now, um, stay there. Stay there. Okay. <laughs> I'm yeah. the demo person. <laughs> of Vanna. Yeah. All right. So I like just like there are conversations going on, I'm I'm squatting here. Conversations going on between all the different lines. You know, the tr you have the soprano and the alto. Okay, so we can also have conversations in sections in this piece. So I want you to do da 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 dum da da dum ba dum. You know, okay, so we're in the we're phrasing fourth line. Fourth line. Is that what you mean? Yeah. You see? Yeah. Now the second line, the second grouping has answered the first. Yes, it's a question yeah. and answer. Just like opera. Right? <laughs> 
just and then you can do and you can you think of da 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 if you want to do whatever you want There's all kinds of interpretive phrasing that you could do with this piece. Mm -hmm. You could play it straight if you want. Mm -hmm. You could play it, you could spend, you could do play this piece for 15 minutes if you had to. Well, and I've had to. You know, I mean, how many <laughs> I mean, times have we had right, to do something right, like right. that, right? I, I, we didn't play it in a major key, and I should have tried that before this Zoom session. I would like to do that um, because maybe you could use it. I mean, it's a processional, yeah, right? I, I've never goes. thought about it as a wedding. Let's Listen. see what happens. Well, this is totally experimental. This is what they call parallel major. So I just changed the harp to A major. Yeah. Just for kids. And this is off the cuff. We have no idea what this is going to yep. sound like. Here we go. You only have one lever down when you do this. Yeah, that might not do. Okay. I hope it's not awful. But um, it makes a great processional, but I wouldn't want to do a wedding processional in a minor key. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I've no. never used it for a wedding. Too sad. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else you got there, Miss Mary? Question? Yeah, we're we're um, Lori says, she's asking if uh, you guys have a book of these improv ideas or any suggestions of something like that. Maybe this means we have to write a book. Yeah, maybe we do. <laughs> Um, well, I have two theory books that you have, Miss Mary, but no, we don't, but we could. Maybe we I've had people something. yell at me for years that I need to get up in gear and start writing some things. I have a lot of ideas. I just haven't written them down. She's a very busy person. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I have two things, though, to say Can real we... quick. I want to make sure we say that memorization. I kind of said this memorization because we said we were going to talk about memorization yes memorization i have this on this outline is simply assigning meaning to content so if you do all the things that we're talking about analyze it think about the phrasing you know you will find that it's automatically like magic memorized because you've assigned meaning to all the content your zip code is 419. Mm -hmm. My house address. I don't think of it. No, my as, area code. Area code. Yeah, area code is 419. I don't think of Toledo when I as 419. You know, when I hear 419, automatically Toledo zip code. My area code. Area code. Area code. Area code. Uh, Detroit area code is 313. 313 usually. You yeah. just, you know, that area code has the, those three. It might be hard to remember three numbers, but associate. once you associate, you associate. Okay. a meaning to it, yeah. Detroit area code, Toledo area code, it's like that. That's exactly what you need to do with music. Assign meaning to the content. The brain develops those neural pathways and memorization becomes very easy. She's really good at that. She's really good at it. <laughs> and the Just last saying. thing is improvisation is simply composition in the moment at, at the time. So if you sit home and you practice and you practice this pavan and you study, you know, different chord patterns like two, one, three, one, or something like that, like we've given to you, all of a sudden that will become much more automatic on a gig and you can improvise on a gig because you practiced it at home. Improvisation is just composition in the moment. In the moment. So I love do your that composition analogy. at home and, and learn how to compose, like do these different compositional techniques at home. And then when you get out on a gig, you've got all your fingers together. Well, and just uh, being ready if you, you know, your fingers get confused, you just make, you just learn to. Oh, I'm a faker. <laughs> You're talking about faking. And yeah, that's how, <laughs> that's how I've gotten by for 50 years. I don't know about you. Um, Another thing about this, go back to just the beginning of this that's written like this, right? I know you've heard it a million times in the last hour. 
But sometimes when I'm working with my students and they're having trouble finding those notes, I'll just take that one measure. I have them play those, those, those are four sixteenth notes. I tell them to play them blocked. And I'm yeah, like, oh, tell absolutely. To, do that, to learn it this way. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And when they ask me why, I tell them because blocked is more difficult than broken. Mm -hmm. And if you can do this, then you can do this. We, we take those groups. I do that all the time. Absolutely. And tell me them to play it block. And too. there's another improvisational thing you could yeah, do. Yeah, that's another technique blocking. you could use. Yes. And the blocking is going to help you with placing, right? Because yes. you have to, they you have have to play them all on. at the same time. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. there's, the, there's the path, right? What else you got, Miss Mary? I know it says five something on the clock now, so. It's 501. We went over. <laughs> Oh, we might have lost Miss Mary because uh, of the weather. You, you didn't go no. over. This is great. This is wonderful. Does anyone have any questions? I think we're all kind of um, sitting here amazed because I've never had two people at the same time. And your rapport with each other is fabulous. I adore this woman. I just have to tell you. She's likewise. She's Mutual admiration. Absolutely society. extraordinary person. Yeah, well... If if we if I had been at my house, like I said, it would have been a blank screen for most of the hour. So I'm so grateful you let me come down here and you use all of your, your Well, studio. I just told my husband, I said, I need the space. And he yeah. had to move some things, but he was willing. And we always so. like a good excuse to get together we anyway. Do. So this was we great. We're just honored that you guys came to hang with us. And I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but if anybody wants to drop me an, an email yes. and ask me anything, are you the same? A absolutely. You know, I'm happy to fix <laughs> all my technical problems. When I answer, <laughs> my email is going to go into your spam file. <laughs> so, best to text me. <laughs> this is another problem I have. Crazy, crazy stuff, right? But I'm happy. I always tell my students, you're not bothering me send me an email if you have a question. And I say, if you don't hear from me in 24 hours, write it again. Because I hear people complaining. My students bother me between lessons. I'm like, that's your job. I, I think, I think Does if, your anyone doctor has, say, yeah. no, if anyone has a question for me, they should write to me, then I'll text the answer to you. <laughs> and you send it on to them. It's no problem. We're, we're just delighted to continue the conversation. You know, I mean, we could done this we had things on our list that we didn't even get that to. we didn't touch so. but but i do have i don't know if that outline is available but um or if you can give that to people miss mary yes but it's it, on the it's on the uh, right. uh chat if you want to scroll up guys okay i will um i'll send a follow-up note like i always do now um uh krista and denise is it okay for me to put your emails in the follow-up letter to the people okay I, I will do that and i agree with you too i want my students to text me and email me in between lessons i love it when they do that yeah that means they're well, engaged or or sometimes it's sometimes often it's a fingering question and if they learned it wrong and oh, it's not working, learning it's oh. so hard yeah well and, and it wastes time at your lesson you know I wasn't kidding when I said my emails land in spam. <laughs> so I will respond, but you should check your spam file. I don't know. You know Wait, I don't know why. Email doesn't like her for some reason. I'm, I'm in a, yeah, there's a lot that doesn't like me right now. Well, ladies, thank you very, very much. This was great. I will do a follow-up and, um, oh, I just forgot what I was going to say. Oh, and then um, I, I will remind everybody that your music is, we've got a special coupon for your music and hopefully people will, will buy your music and be just so happy with it. Thank you. Thank yes. you. We appreciate that. We're honored. And well, thank I'm honored that you agreed to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks to all of our participants. How many really? were here? We can't see that from where we are. Uh, most was 19 at once. Nice. Wow, that's, that's great. Awesome. Well, so yeah, we're that's very. Great. That's a lot of people um, have emailed me, and they they wanted they couldn't make it today, but they really are looking forward to the replay. Great, great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank Welcome. you. I will sign off for now. Thank you. Okay.
Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.